Let's take a look at the full route profile for today's stage then. 195 almost entirely flat kilometres on a stage that runs Saint to Saint, saint gilles de bois to Saint-Malo. The intermediate sprint is late after 127 kilometres, so the top points there may be swept up by the day's breakaway. But very little chance of them making it to the finish, especially with the sprinters teams fresh after the rest day. As I say, the wind will make the run-in interesting, so we might see the overall favourites at the front end too, fighting to be on the right side of any splits in the field. Sky were hoping for an afternoon off today while the sprint teams contested the finish here in St Malo. And I don't think they're going to be disappointed. However, I'm not sure it's going to be the extended rest day they were hoping for. The riders are now on this coastal road and will remain so all the way to the line. And apart from just one slight bend right at the end, it's not at all technical. However, this wind pushing them hard on the right-hand side may make it a dramatic final for more than just the fast men. If the wind is blowing as predicted, then teamwork will need to be absolutely perfect. And not just for the sprint outfits, for the GC squads too. There'll be precious little shelter for lone individuals, and with the incentive of a stage win on the horizon, the pressure won't ease up for regrouping. So any splits that do occur are likely to stick. That means the GC riders and sprinters alike find themselves in trouble. Lotto Bellasol, Omega Pharma, Quickstep, Argos, Shimano, all of the sprint teams have copped it up on at least one occasion in this race. So today's final might not be contested by the fastest men, but by the team able to leverage these climatic conditions. 10 kilometers to go. They are still hanging off the front. A giant carrot to the peloton. Uh, but the peloton are coming, believe me. It's about 15 seconds now. As we're looking at these four riders here, 187 kilometers in the lead, the peloton is closing in. Simon's uh, put his name on the Tour de France today, this kid in his first tour. This is where he spends all his life training, all his family live in the area, he's passed through his hometown, and he's been on television all day. Now, a little bit of a problem with David Miller, he's decided now his pacemaking is done, and he's dropping off the back of the pack. They've made Sam Malo at the same time as the peloton. They looked over the shoulder, 191 kilometers in the lead. A quick attack by Matei. Desperate moments require desperate things. And it's going to be at least uh, Louis Angel Matei will be the last to be caught. They've in, been in the lead for 191 kilometers today. Well, they're now all together once again. They're the teams of the sprint. It'll be interested to see which sprinter's team is the one that's going to take the, the, the reins of this peloton this afternoon again. <laughs> Julia Simon still wants to keep going. He wants to keep his name at the top end of the leaderboard. But look what's happening behind the organisation coming. That Stuart O'Grady takes up the pace behind him. Stuart O'Grady, second oldest man in the race, has got control for Orica Greenedge. They honoured him yesterday on the team back at the start area. Special uh, party for him. And now he's brought the, he's the first to close it all down because now Simon has surrendered in style, I have to say. Orica Greenedge getting the front. They've got a good sprint in Matthew Goss. Also notice now the organisation of the lime green jerseys of Cannondale. They're taking up for the pacemaking over on the left-hand side. Five kilometres to go. Five kilometres, three miles to the finish. O'Grady for Orica Greenedge, the team that had the dream first week. With the stage win with Simon Gerrans, they won the team time trial. They had two different leaders on their team for a total of four days. Now they're out of hunting again, and O'Grady is riding better than ever in his Tour de France. Yep, 17 participations for Stuart O'Grady. The reason he's doing this is probably he's probably got the nod from Matty Goss to say, look, I can get up there this afternoon. I'm one of the best sprinters in the world too. Let's not forget about Andre Greipel and Mark Cavendish. Matthew Goss knows exactly how to come out of the pack. It's still Alberto Contador's team on the left-hand side and the yellow jersey of Chris Froome still remaining close to the front. And look at this, Contador the climber sitting in second place on the left of the picture with his teammates making the pace. Watch out too for Kwiatkowski in that white jersey. He's creeping up on the left of the picture as well as they both continue to drive, up, drive forward now. Everything being thrown to the wall now at four kilometres to go. Two big teams of the sprinters are on the right-hand side there, on the left-hand side as we look from this angle. Contador is third wheel, but more importantly, on the left-hand side 
of the of the road we've got Omega Pharma quick step and Lotto Belisol trying to get this organization for their sprinters Tony Martin has come to the front on the right hand side now Sylvain Chavanel another teammate of Mark Cavendish is keeping in company in that orange bike but they're all trying to get to the front and including Chris Froome is being washed away a little bit right now and getting into the da danger zone of the peloton on this final run-in. But look how many riders are being tailed off because of the pressure of Omega Farmer Kipster. In the, in the line behind them, it's Lotto Bellasol. They're looking for control. This is a battle for supremacy of the sprinters' teams. Matthew Goss is the third rider on the left of our picture here who is being brought along and Matthew Goss it must be feeling good that's why O'Grady is working with them at the front but the big team of Andre Gripe with those yellow flashes at three kilometres to go has got Lotto Bellasol in situation they are currently holding the right position They're over on the left-hand side of the road. A nasty little traffic service oh we get into town here. The peloton splits apart and comes back together again. Lotto Bellisol have got to get themselves organised. Now, the best place to try and win this sprint is to hug the left-hand side of the road. A little bit of a disorganisation, a shout going back to Lotto Bellisol. Somebody has lost the line. Yes, and uh, Lotto Bellasol were the ones to take a knock there because Amigo Farmer quick step, the team of Cavendish have moved over to the left. A little bit sliced out of it by Lotto Bellasol because they're still trying to set it up. Oliver oh, Green Edge here for another Aussie victory. Well, Lotto Bellasol are in uh, the second row there now. They take over the pacemaking on the front. The second place rider there is uh, Marcus Seaberg. Adam Hansen is the man in front. The rider who is in fourth position in that line is the Kiwi Greg Henderson. Right on his wheel is Andre Greipel. As they go under two to go, in fact, uh, Matthew Goss lost control of that and he's dropped out of it. His teammate uh, realised he was helping nobody. And so Goss, for the moment, off our screens here now. The Lotto Bellasol are all perfectly formed. They know that Cavendish has got his team lined up as well. Well, at the moment, advantage Lotto Bellasol and Andre Greipel. Now, they will know how this race is going to unfold. They'll know they're going to start to pick up a tailwind as they get into town, and they'll know how fast this race is going to be. I can see the green jersey of uh, Peter Sagan right in the middle there, looking for the wheel of the German. Marcel Kittel with his boys in white on the left. They've also got John Denton, who can sprint. And he's the big boy, third man down. Kittel is fourth man down. No sign of Peter Sagan just yet. Mark Cavendish just keeping in the wings, but he's down there in that white jersey with the red, white, and blue bands on it. Now, remember, this is not a simple last kilometre. They've got a turn, very slight turn, just before they hit the finishing line. Well, one kilometre to go now. It's going to take these riders 60 seconds to get to the finish line. They are travelling at 40-something miles an hour. You can see that still Lotto Bellisol have got great organisation in the front there, but they're now being charged by the white jerseys of Marco Simano. Now, the tailwind is causing high speeds. The peloton behind is splitting up, and they might well split time, this peloton, today. But it's a perfect lead-out for Greipel at the moment is Stegmans. And, in fact, Cavendish has chosen not to follow his teammate Gerd Stegmans, but to drop into the line alongside him and pick up Greipel. So the big lead-out coming by Greg Henderson now for Andre Greipel. Is Greipel going to make this a second stage with him? Cavendish is fourth wheel as there's a rush up the right of the road now. But as they go towards the line, there's a crash right in the middle there. As they come off the line, this is Greipel now being challenged by Marcel Kittel. As they come round that bend, it's gone to the photo. Right on the line, it was close. You see the slight bend there as they saw the finish. So it, it was between Marcel Kittel and Andre Greipel. Uh, and one rider on the road there. That's Declan Cole going back to see how he is. He took a nasty fall. He did, and we'll come back to him in a second. First the result, and the photo finish showed Kittel taking it on the line from Andre Greipel with Mark Cavendish third and Peter Sagan fourth. Now, the man on the floor was Tom Vailers, one of Marcel Kittel's Argos Shimano lead-out men. And here's how he got there. Once his job is done and Kittel has launched his sprint, Vailers starts to go backwards. The white line in the middle of the road is a handy reference, and you can see Vilas certainly drifts across it to the right. Then Cavendish, seeing the wheel he wants to take, which is Greipel's on the left, starts to go around Vilas, but doesn't get all the way around before he deviates from his line. And the result is that Vilas goes down. So, there's no doubt Vilas moves from his line first. It's a question of the degree to which Cavendish then swoops left. And the head-on shot is perhaps more damning because it shows him bracing and leaning in in anticipation of the impact. 
So here's the stage result pending any revision by the race jury. Kittle, Greipel, Cavendish, Sagan. Then William Bonnet, Alexander Christoph, Samuel Dumoulin and Kevin Reza, with all the other big names safely in the bunch behind them. Right, let's hear from the two men involved in the crash, starting with Mark Cavendish. Mark, what, what happened there at the end? What was your view of the uh, incident at the end there? It was a sprint. Yes, correct, yeah. We ran out of guys there, uh, and uh, Gert went early, you know. Um, it would have been too far for me to go if I'd have gone with him. I tried to get on another train and then, uh, yeah, it just got beaten. And uh, a rider went down there. Here it's Tom Vila's of Argos. Did you get a view of uh, a bit of the argy bargy there? No, but I tried to touch with him. But the road's bare and left. I know you're trying to get all the... Oh, Mark Cavendish, a really bad sprinter again. The road's bare and left. 150 metres ago, the road bare's left. I'm, Either I go, I follow the road or I hit the barriers I want, you know what I mean? Like, so I think if anyone's trying to get a oh, Mark Cavendish dangerous win, I think you're, part, like, you're in the wrong way, you know? Not at all, there's gonna Mark. Be, there's going to be internet forums and all that yeah. going crazy about it, you know, but uh, the road players left. I'm going to follow the road and not go into the barriers, as simple as it. Yeah, sometimes in these sprints at the end here, we, uh, absolutely no attempt to put any blame on you at all, Mark. Sometimes in these sprints... Well, the uh, commissaires have already, I think, you know. At the end of the day, you can see he moves a little bit right, I move a little bit left. It's not like I've took his wheel, I'm following the road, and it was the arms that touched anyway. It wasn't like took his front wheel out, so... Yeah. Mark, what have you heard from the commissaires? Uh, Alex just told me that if I'd have won, they'd have relegated they me. They are reviewing no, no answer for them. It's access and quite normal for me, though. They're reviewing it. it. As far as you're concerned, it's an absolutely regular sprint. There was a bit of a, well, bit of a touch The there. road's going to left. Make, make a straight sprint. I hope he, who, who's it, Tom Beelers? Yeah. I hope he's OK anyway. Mark Cavendish uh, came, uh, came on me, uh, steering in front of me, and yeah, sort of pushed me off my bike. How do you feel about that situation? Yeah, now, but um, uh, yeah, it is what it is, it happened. Uh, I can't turn it around anymore. What do you think should happen with Cavendish after this? I leave that up to the jury. They have to decide uh, yeah, whether, uh, what they do. I'm not, uh, not the person who, uh, who, uh, who can decide or have to has to decide it. I think it's disrespectful to make it out like it's a big loss for us when Kittle wins. He's an incredible bike rider. His team ride really well. and. Uh, yeah, he's done today again the same top four that there normally is in the sprint day. So. Is there anything you could have done differently? Yes. I think we as a team could have done something differently, yeah. But we'll talk about that later. Oh. So the green jersey is still in the range. I don't know. Was it your fault, Mark? Oh, your fault? Was what? Was what? Was what? Was what? Was what? Why are you taking my tape recorder? Mark, I would like my tape recorder back, please. I'm just asking you a question. Can I have my tape recorder? What was my fault? I lost the screen. Tom, just to be absolutely clear, as far as you're concerned, uh, this wasn't simply a racing incident. Uh, Mark Cavendish was at fault here. Uh, it was Mark Cavendish's fault, yeah. yeah. yeah I think that was pretty clear uh, from the video as well. The race jury, however, saw it differently, declining to penalise Mark Cavendish on the basis that Vila's deviated from his line first, which he undoubtedly did, and then leaving it at that without further conclusions on what happened next. Among the things that did happen next, other than the tape recorder Mark Cavendish had snatched from that American journalist being returned to him, was Marcel Kittel taking the podium for his second stage win of the Tour, a victory unlike the first one in that it included all his major rivals. I'm very proud that, uh, yeah, that we won today, that uh, the sprint was like that, that I could beat even Greipel really close on the line. And uh, yeah, I have to say a big thank you to my teammates. They did an amazing job. Yeah, it's, it's just a pity that uh, Tom crashed so bad in the last uh, 100 meters. Now, picking his way past the crashes for a fighting fourth, Peter Sagan limited his losses to Andre Greipel in the green jersey competition and still has a healthy lead over both him and Mark Cavendish. No change at all at the top of the overall standings. Chris Froome had a relatively easy ride, as did all his big rivals. So he'll spend his third day in the yellow jersey tomorrow, although he'll actually be swapping it for a yellow skin suit, looking to pad his advantage in the time trial.